This weekend I'm going to the Sung Ai Yu Wildlife Corridor and this is a, a, like an 11 kilometer stretch of forest that connects Tamanagara, the main national park, with the main range of hills that runs like a spine you know, down through Malaysia. And these two areas combined are one of the largest habitats for wild tigers in the world. So, you know, they're, they're really critical areas. But this corridor, this 11 kilometer corridor, acts as a kind of bottleneck for any animals trying to move from the national park to the main range. And as such, it's an area where they're highly vulnerable to poaching. So I'm going up there with uh, my cats on an initiative that they call the Catwalks. And, you know, I want to find out how the Catwalks are helping, you know, to deter, you know, the, the poachers from operating in this, uh, this Sung Ai Yu Wildlife uh, Corridor. Okay, so it's Friday. I'm in Tamanagara for the second time with my cat and, uh, you know, nowhere else I'd rather be on a Friday. Here with Ashley Xiao, a good friend who arranges all these things. And actually, I just wanted, I mean, maybe you could explain. The last one I went on was a trailblazer, a my cat trailblazer trip. And this one is uh, the catwalk. But, I mean, what, what, what is the difference? Well, I guess the difference is between the family saloon car and the, uh, the racing car. Okay. Well, with your trailblazer, what you did was you went for a week into the jungle. Yeah. You backpacked your stuff in there and uh, you went in for five days. You camped there for five days or six days actually and then came out. Yeah. And uh, that's not really for everybody. That's for, you know, quite people who are quite fit, who want a bit of a challenge. And people who can take a week off work. And I people guess. who can take yeah. a week off work, yeah. which most of us can't do. So um, really what the catwalk is, it's a weekend walk. Uh, two separate day walks, uh -huh. uh, no overnight in the jungle, and uh, it's something that um, people can do on a weekend, drive up. Drive up on the Friday. Drive up on the Friday evening, a walk on Saturday, uh -huh. um, have a nice meal at uh, one of the local towns, and Sunday do a short walk again, and then do some camera trapping, check the camera traps which we have uh, throughout the park to monitor the wildlife, uh -huh. uh, which is the thing that, you know, a lot of people have never done, they've seen it done on National Geographic and so on, and here they get to hands-on. These are their photos, these are the photos they obtain from the camera traps, they place the camera traps, not us. Um, we have selected the sites, of course, because these are the sites where there is a high incidence of wildlife. Uh -huh. And uh, and then they drive home with, uh, yeah. So they're back Sunday night in they're the big They're back Sunday city. night and then go on Monday morning, they've got a great story to tell their friends. Yeah, it sounds good. So I'm on a, a main track that goes through Tamanagara here, and it's not somewhere that you might think you're going to spot tigers. You might think they're you know, deep in the jungle, but in fact, for tigers, they see these uh, you know these these trails as just being a, a very nice open, clear trail for them to go on, and they, and they use them quite a lot. And uh, I'll show you here where Ashley and Harrison are putting up a camera trap on a tree that to to uh, keep an eye on this trail. Okay, so this is the camera trap, you've got the flash here, uh, the, the lens there, and there's the, the infrared sensor at the bottom. If I just open this up, this is basically just a waterproof case. There's the typical digital camera in there, and um, this is the, the sort of motherboard controlling the sensor. And where do they stay? I mean, so if they're not camping in the jungle, is that...? Oh, well, they have a number of options. Um, what, what is the standard one is, is that they go to um, a chalet. Sorry. Yeah. They go to a dormitory. Uh, these are pretty nice clean dormitories, uh, nice um, proper toilets and everything like that. Uh, but people can upgrade themselves to, to chalets or air-conditioned chalets if oh, they want they need to. It. Yeah, but they don't need lots of camping equipment and no, tents they don't. and... But, yeah. but some people, um, they, don't, they, don't, they think that since they've come all this way to the jungle, they don't really want to spend it in the air-conditioning. Sure. So yeah. they, uh, they want to camp by the river and that's something they can do as well. So they've got the option. They've got the option and yeah. it should be said actually that camping out uh, uh, particularly at this time of the year is uh, it, it's probably cooler down by the river than it is in the yeah. chalet. I, yeah. I can believe that. It's a nice early return to camp today which is a pleasant change so plenty of time to get the hammock set up put some dinner on. So night time in the jungle and the volunteers are camped just uh, below where I put my hammock up. And it might sound a bit noisy all these uh, insects, but it's more like a lullaby, it just sends you straight off to sleep.
This is a pill millipede. I was going to hang on and try and wait. Oh, he is opening up a little bit. Oh, no. But everybody's going in front, so I'm not going to be able to... Oh, there he is. There we go. He's struggling to turn over. There we go. There we go. Wait! <laughs> what's, what's that, Harrison? Trying to climb the tree. Oh, bear claw, bear claw markings. Yeah. Some bear. Pine legs. Yes, yeah, most probably. So here we've come to like one of the uh, limestone outcrops, which are kind of a feature of this landscape. And you can see it towering above me here. And uh, you know, a lot of them are orientated in a north-south direction. So. They, you know, probably they were, you know, along the course of some like, very, very old river. But they're pretty impressive cases. Right, this is like nature's handrail. Really good. Ficus, so practically indestructible. And Ash, am I right in saying they make bridges, like living bridges, using ficus roots? They do in northeastern India and West Java. They make bridges that last for 500 years. They're self-renewing and uh, self-repairing. So they just train the roots to go across the river? That's right. And but it takes about three generations to get the bridge done. Amazing, huh? Yeah. Quite a good place to look for water. It's gorgeous. It's just dripping down. Easy to collect. So here we've got a bat cave and a hollowed out log. Let's see if I can show you. And with my cat, I mean the trailblazer and the uh, the catwalk. I mean, what's the? I mean, how is that helping the sort of tiger conservation effort in Malaysia? Right. The um, the thing is that jungle areas are the hardest to patrol in the in the world. You can send aeroplanes up there; they can't see anything below the canopy. Uh, you can't drive particularly far because the roads are uh, are not there, and at certain time of the year they're inaccessible. So basically, all patrols have to be on foot. So that really stretches the wildlife ranges. Um, so what with citizen conservation, what happens is, is this. People come in and they do recreational activities in critical wildlife corridors between the national park and the main range um, and in the border areas. That frees up the ranges to patrol the deep, deep forest right. where, the, um, where some of the poaching is going on for the most endangered species like tigers. So here we've got an animal trail crossing the main human trail, if you like, and this is a place where poachers like to lay snares because it's basically they're lazy. So they'll come down the main, uh, the main trail and then just follow this animal trail in and put some snares in. So I'm just going to check it out. So we're up on a plateau here looking for snares. I mean, this is obviously you know, a well-used human trail. A lot of the trees have, have got markings on them. Um, where you get humans, can't often get snares, and see if we can spot any. But it's not easy to find these things. What has been shown elsewhere in the world is that if you have an alert population who's aware of what the law is, does not agree with the whole notion of um, poaching animals for traditional Chinese medicine and so on, is that uh, the incidence of poaching goes down. See, okay, most of the yeah. poachers are, um, and, we, and we don't see poachers as, uh, as the enemy or anything like that. Uh, most of them are actually opportunistic weekend poachers. They mm. have ordinary jobs in, uh, in rural areas like motor mechanics mm. uh, and things like that. And then they think they can earn a few, a few dollars extra uh, by, by trapping animals, which they don't consume for their own family. They actually sell to 
traders who sell wild meat or to restaurants or, or restaurants and yeah, so on yeah. and if it is a species that is part in demand because of uh, its horn uh -huh. or its claws or its gallbladders and things like that uh, then that ends up in the uh, in the trade in the wildlife trade in wildlife farms for the Chinese medicine shops and uh, what usually have you. yes yeah. that's right um, so so if basically we can um, you want to, what you want to do with poaching is you you want to stop it before it happens. Oh. So if the detection rate is probably quite high, then people are deterred from going in and doing it in the first place. Right, right. You know, it's not a question of hammering the person once they've been convicted of a crime. Although that by, is necessary. By then the animal's already dead anyway. By then the animal's yeah. already dead. Yeah. Um, of course, it's necessary to have realistic punishments yeah. uh, because that is part of the deterrence. Sure. But you don't want to, you know... Uh, but a you better option is for them the not to go right in. right at the beginning, yeah. yes, yeah. that's right, prevention. And, um, you know, people who are doing something which they know to be illegal, they don't really like to be seen doing it. So if, you know, if there are people camping, people climbing, canoeing... It's more eyes tracking, and ears, That's really. right, yes. Yeah. So if we see a, a snare or something like that, we, uh, we, we mark the site um, and we report it to the wildlife authorities. They come mm. by and uh, they remove it. Right. Yeah. No, I think it's great. I mean, the more people there are checking checking on the jungle, the less easy it is for the poachers to kind of act with impunity or, yes. you know, without anyone knowing what they're doing. Well, one, yeah. um, the signs are encouraging, um, encouraging that we find less snares than yeah. we have in the past. Um, uh, something which is sad, but in a way is also encouraging, is that we find a lot of disused snares, sometimes mm. with dead animals in them, mm. which actually shows that these opportunistic poachers, they set the snares and they don't come in and check them that often, mm. which is extremely unfortunate for the, uh, the animals mm. that are trapped, but it does suggest that one, that you know they don't need it and they are being deterred from coming in well, that's good for, for, for yeah. a variety of reasons. Yeah. Excellent, thank you very much. Not for at all. It. Come, yeah. Let's carry on with the walk then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is an elephant tray, I can tell by mud. Yeah, that's right. In the tree. Obvious contrast here. And you can tell all the foliage being bent over instead of being cut. Mm. Yeah, the mud here is actually from the uh, sides of the elephants rubbing against a tree. So we deposit mud on the sides of a tree. This one's not that big because it's not that high up. It's normally a bit higher up for the larger ones. And lower down as well, there's quite an obvious contrast between well, bark. All the way down from here. Yeah. 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 <coughs> so uh, a young adult. Yeah. One elephant footprint. To understand why the catwalk initiative is so important, you have to kind of get inside the head of a poacher. Because you've basically got two types of poachers. You know, on the one hand, you've got like organized criminal gangs of poachers who will go, you know, for weeks at a time deep into the forest. Um, you know, and stopping those types of poachers is really the remit of the government and the wildlife department and the rangers. But there's another type of poacher, what I call a weekend um, poacher or an opportunistic poacher. And these are guys who, you know, live near areas of high wildlife concentration. They might live near to you know, the national park or a wildlife corridor. And, you know, they just see uh, snaring or poaching as a, as a quick and easy way to make an extra buck. And, you know, what these guys look for is, is easy access. You know, they want, like, somewhere with a dirt road, preferably like this, that can get them most of the way uh, to the area where the wildlife are and they can access that you know on a motorbike then all they need is some wire cable some pliers you know and they can set their snares and they're easily put off if life is made difficult for them and the last thing they want is for people to be in the area where they're setting their snares because they know what they're doing is illegal even making a wire snare is illegal in Malaysia so you know if you have like groups of catwalkers in the area you know, it's simply going to put them off in fact, the more people that use these sort of easily accessible areas, uh, you know, for recreational activities, the better, you know, because yeah, they're going to act as the eyes and ears, you know, for the wildlife department. And, you know, they'll be able to report any sort of any snares they, they find or people doing anything, you know, illegal as regards wildlife. So, you know, the thing is this, it's like any conservation effort. Yes, the government has its part to play, but, you know, so to do, you know, do we as individuals. And, you know, that really is what Catwalk's all about. Thank <laughs> you.